Every parent is wired to keep their kids safe and alive. And when you're dealing with drug addiction and alcoholism, you're dealing with something that can take your kid away. 100%. And so you're, to make a shift as a parent, when you have a child that's in their 20s, 30s, 40s, when you, when you start to make that shift of taking your hands off, which is a, a really helpful statement, hands off pays off. Mm -hmm. So when we take our hands off of the child, it hurts us. Where I'm going about my day with nothing wrong, nothing on my mind, and I am stymied by one thought I call it the four W's, the wishing, worrying, wondering, and waiting. I wonder what he's doing. And from there, I spiral into this. It's so the onset of obsession. Uh, onset of obsession. I oh. spiral into this place of desperation and thinking and thinking and thinking. I start detaching from everything around me. I can't connect with the other people in my life. I move into this world where I am totally alone and in agony. Or it's the middle of the night and I wake up and I wonder if they're cold, I wonder if they're alone, I wonder if they're alive. And I'm telling you, that obsession, which is just like with alcohol and drugs. It's a cycle of addiction, yeah. It is. My obsession is with them. It was the symptoms of codependency this irresistible urge to take care of a problem before they ask. Uh. So before they have a chance to even ask for help, I'm solving it. I've got the answers, I know what they need to do, I know when they need to do it, you know, I've got the money, I got this, I got that, and, and it never allows them the dignity of their own choice. No. They it, never get a chance to ask, and I that's a tool. That is. To listen for them to ask for a reasonable request. That doesn't mean asking for money for dope. Reasonable request. Yeah. Doesn't mean telling me I've got an interview, I need clothes, yeah. and bam, you know, send the money. They don't have an interview. <laughs> <laughs> See, we go to extremes. We're over involved or under involved. We're going to cut them off and we're never going to talk to them again. And that might help happen actually with a husband or a wife yeah. or, some, or a brother or a sister. But I'm telling you, it is very difficult to cut your child out. I think a lot of times that that is done by what I've seen my parents do is they're trying to decease the pain. Mm -hmm. um, it's something my mom did for me. It's, it changed my life. But I, I can't imagine having to do that. But it has to be to stop that agonizing pain you're talking about. Her pain. Her pain. Right. And that's not always the best thing to do. No. Yes, hold your boundaries, but completely removing, I think, is a, it's a conditioned response for a parent trying to save themselves continued heartache and pain. Yeah. I mean, I've spoken to parents who talk about the phone rings and they've got... Oh, PTSD? Yes. <laughs> is it the cops? Is it the hospital? What's right. going on? Where's he at? Where's yeah. she at? Where... That's the trigger to regression. And when that happens, we get wired with this constant unknown and unpredictability of addiction. And when it happens, limbic system, you know, it's just like with the alcoholic and addict, something triggers this thought or familiar. That's why I used to get it when I'd see my phone and see their number. And I would, it would literally, I'd feel the cortisol. Now I know what that was. It was this big, huge release of hormones in my body. And I would answer and try to have an answer right away. To relieve it. To relieve it. And what I learned was that is when you do nothing. That is not when you answer the phone. That is when you breathe, you stop, you take some breaths, some deep breaths. You calm that emotional brain so you get into your consciousness, into your frontal lobe where your intelligence resides and you can make decisions that are in your and their best interest. So you're switching out drivers. You're telling the limbic system to take a back seat. That's right. That prefrontal cortex. Hold on. Let's look at the facts here. Let's look at this cognitively and figure out what's going on instead yes. of that reaction. Reaction. Exactly. Save, rescue. And so that, that whole trigger to regression, the trigger, and what happens for parents is they're triggered constantly. And you can trigger it and activate it with a thought. 
And so you're constantly in this, whether it's happening outside of you or not, doesn't matter. My own thoughts can create this activation of this cortisol and this living in this highly stressed, highly stressed place. Have you ever seen a parent stay in this cycle yes. for comfortability? When you take the drug away, they detox from that. Right. The same happens for a parent. They create their own problem. <laughs> we do. We initiate the thinking, which brings us right back to the crisis, the drama, the problem solving. Because remember, when we make a change, like with codependence, what it's about is I'm able to say no. No is a whole sentence. Or to even say, uh, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. Right. That pause. The pause. The pause, give me a minute to The go pause ahead. is a big deal because the, remember when they, and you know this, when they come at you, it, it's like a crisis. It's like a last oh, minute we're good. thing. I wouldn't be this way if you hadn't, you know, when I'll dad never left, ask you, again. I'll never ask again. Can't you just do this for me? I mean, right. what kind of mother are you? <laughs> Everything we, and the parents don't understand a lot of times, like these are, you are dealing with, you're not negotiating with a child. No, you you're not. dealing with a limbic system specifically built to manipulate anything they can out That's of right, and to get it. There's nothing, there's nothing off the table. Right. Talk about the secrets that we share between uh, a parent and child that maybe dad doesn't know or mom right. doesn't know. I'll threaten those, I'll black. Right. Oh the man, and that's, you're hitting on something very important. When you have a couple, maybe both parents, but maybe a parent and a step-parent, what happens, what begins to happen is secrets. Yeah. They no longer are talking about what's next to do. They're keeping secrets from each other. So one, one parent will be sending money while the other one thinks they're not. And so what happens is this division between the, the parents, the, the unit, um, the sanity starts to move away. And, um, and that kind of leads into the, one of the big symptoms of codependency is the enabling. And is it enabling or empowering? When I solve a problem for someone that they're able to solve for themselves, that is enabling. Because I'm, I'm fixing something that's not mine to fix, for starters, but I'm, I'm, I'm also taking away the privilege of learning how to navigate life and learning from your mistakes. It, it's, it, I agree 1000% and I see it in the way I relate to it and the way I try to explain it to, to my parents is it's like a lioness not teaching her cubs how to hunt. Exactly. They have to know how to survive. So what we want to do is we want to empower our children. We want to give them the ability to navigate life, failures and successes, yeah. um, and experience that. So how do we do that? And, and a big piece is for me to get some clarity for myself about what I want. You know, what I want for myself. <laughs> a lot of times I'll ask parents, well, what do you want? Well, I want them to be clean and sober. Well, what do you want for yourself? Uh, blank. Blank. So something I see sometimes, well, even if their child's doing amazing, mm -hmm. the Adams, and it makes sense now as you, as you talk about it, the obsession starts to right. hit. Right. What's going on? Where the engine? Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if their value resides within the child needing it. It does. Yeah. So it originates way back in that early wiring of a child where they begin to view themselves as they're seen and it's reflected back. So who you tell me I am is who I am. In the beginnings of recovery, you, you move, you have to detox from the drama and the trauma and the crises. Just like anybody who decides to enter into a recovery process is going to change one decision at a time. A big piece of this is I have to find out who I am in this. So I tried to control it. Literally, I, I sold drug screens, I 
chased them. I was like my kid's worst nightmare. For for the the addicted child, those those decisions being made by a parent, like for me personally, it, it affects you. Like you go through your own, oh my God, I'm being denied. Like they're finally done. Right. And then right after the acceptance that they're finally done is the, holy crap, I better get my shit together. Right. And what we've done is we've eliminated the soft landing place. Yeah. It doesn't mean I don't love you. And actually it, it's a harder thing to do to yeah. say, okay, enough. And, and we try saying no, and that no is a whole sentence. Unfortunately, we get there, usually when we get there, we're so angry, you know, which anger is a helpful emotion in that it activates change. You know, it gets action going, where the sadness and the depression and the grief kind of hold us in that kind of uh, very lethargic place. We think we have a lot of shame on board, but, but how we'll know we do is with a woman, she will have this um, ability to do everything and no one will ever see her sweat. And then when she's alone and that desperation and agony washes over her and that aloneness happens and then she braces up and goes about her business because she doesn't want to tell anybody that her heart is crushed for her child. For her child. And then you have a dad who the big symptom of shame for him is don't look weak. A lot of moms go to fixing their kids for relief and they get momentary relief. That's why codependency stays alive because for a moment you get relief. You buy them groceries, you know they're not hungry. And you got to re-up because yeah. it goes quick. That it doesn't fast. last long. That fast. So helping is one of the most noble uh, characteristics in the human race to be helpful when it goes to the extreme where we're addicted to helping and we take care of things before they even evolve and part of what happens with that is 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 that like I said before it doesn't give the person the dignity of their own choice they don't have a chance to try their own solutions we will go to the same extremes as the addict will so on the codependent continuum, there's kind of two different varieties. There's the loving, uh, can't, I just can't tolerate them not thinking I love them. I, I can't, uh, and notice the words here, it's I can't. It's yeah. not what they're experiencing, it's what the codependent is experiencing. I can't imagine what it would be like for me to say no. I can't, I don't think they can figure that out. I don't think they know how. I've never seen them be able to do it. What if they get cold? What if they're outside all night? So I'll tell you, that's one. And then on the other end of that continuum is the punisher. You don't do what I want, I will punish you. I will withdraw my love. I will not talk to you. I will get silent. Mm -hmm. I will yell at you. I will belittle you. You'll pay a price before I help you. So that, that's all on that continuum of codependency. We have to be willing to really take a look, do an inventory, so to speak, um, get a list of symptoms of codependency, and you could look at it and just pick your top 10. Yeah. You know, it, and it's not, remember this is not an indictment. Codependency is developed as a strategy to navigate the most awful of every parent's nightmare, the potential of losing your child. I don't mean losing them where they're not at home, I mean they're dead. Okay. That is the, the fear that is dominating this strategy of taking care of, fixing, calling. It's stemming from the biological instinct as a parent to yes. protect your Absolutely. child. And we've taken it like so many other basic instincts meant for our survival. We put it into overdrive. Overdrive. That makes That's sense. exactly right. That helps us survive uh, really difficult life things. Once was helpful, now becomes harmful. So this codependency, this disease of codependency now takes on a life of its own. They're not dealing with us anymore. They're yeah. not dealing with mom or dad or brother or sister. They're dealing 
with codependency, the disease. Yeah, I mean, as somebody in, in recovery, as you start to get your legs underneath you, as you start to realize, hey, maybe I can make some decisions, and there's a parent there mm -hmm. controlling all these things, it does, it does, it puts different thought processes in your yeah. head. Maybe I can't do this. Right. Well, wait a minute. What happens if mom's not around? Like, can I do this when they're not around? Right. Maybe I really haven't got this. Maybe this is, you start to doubt mm -hmm. your ability to succeed without that controller being there. Right. And then for a, a, a lot of us, that, that can be a, an opportunity for us to go, oh, well. Yeah, why try? Why try? In order for a codependent to recover, what it goes back to is I have to be able to know when I'm activated. Now, it can happen so easily. I can hear one thing and, it, and I can now, because I'm going to gently notice what's happening. And this is where you begin to recover. You begin to gently, not with that critical judge that there's something bad or wrong about you, but you're gonna, with that gentle observer within you, you're gonna start noticing what your thoughts are. So, for instance, you hear, I didn't pick up my medication, and you, the co, begins to notice what your thoughts are. Well, geez, what if they don't pick it up? If they don't pick it up, what's gonna happen next? How do, maybe they don't, do they not have the money to pick it up? Do they need me to help them pick it up? Do I need to go for it? You, you start to notice the train is in the station and it's blowing <laughs> out. And it happens like that in a second. If we are aware, which like I said in the beginning, the beginning is being willing to look at myself when I'm aware of that, the very first thing I do, because what's happened is that limbic system has been woke up and it's starting to excrete all of the stress hormones into my body, which is gonna put me into fight or flight and I'm gonna take off and launch. And I'm gonna fix this. And what I really have learned to do, and every time you do it, every single time, you change and lay down new wiring. We don't get rid of the wiring that's there. We add new, more effective, more helpful wiring. So in that case, if the parent notices the thought process starting, because that's what happens, the mind is not always your friend and it's not wow. always telling you the truth. You take a breath, you drop your shoulders, you breathe in, I like to breathe in for four, hold it for four and exhale for four and do it at least four times. And during that time, I start to start to quiet that emotional brain of mine. And I get into my intelligence and I go, whoa, Karen, that's a slippery slope right there. You're gonna decide. Nobody has asked you for help. Nobody said, can you help me out here? Um, I didn't even ask, would you like some help? So, so wait a minute, get back into Karen. This is theirs to deal with. And there's something, it's called self-soothing. <laughs> and every addict, I don't care which end of the addiction you're on, has to learn how to, wait a minute, I've dealt with really difficult things before and made it out. Yeah. I can deal with real discomfort and pain and make it through. I can not help when that would give me temporary relief and have longer relief. So, so self-soothing, uh, gently observing yourself, paying attention to what's happening in your mind and your emotions, getting familiar with this organism that you live in, right. and, and finding out what goes on for you. And what we want to do is notice that I'm stoking the fire. Just begin there. Just notice it. Once we get conscious, we're going to start to change. Vulnerability is the birthplace of change. If I want to change, I have to be willing to look. And if I'm going to look at myself, I cannot do it with a critical eye. I want to do it with a gentle observer. I have developed strategies to survive thinking my kid's going to die. There, this is not an indictment, codependency. This is a way that we've survived and it's not working anymore. That's the problem. In fact, it's been turned against us. And now it's creating pain. Have you seen, um, well, on the parent side, and I don't want to put responsibility of somebody's recovery on anybody, but have you seen it cause difficulties with, when the addicted child gets into recovery? 
with the parent wanting to continually pull them back into the cycle. Sure, because remember, it's, it's, we're familiar with that cycle. That's why it's so important to have a support group of some kind, you know, or be in a, get, working with a therapist who understands it or in a family group, because, because what's familiar we'll want more of. And what's unfamiliar, anytime we make a change, you know, changing, uh, doing it differently creates discomfort yeah. to to our to our limbic system, to our to our brain. Yeah. And it says, no, no, wait a minute, we've always done it this way and you're alive, you're not dead. Yeah. So let's keep doing it. And so if you're gonna we have to tolerate the discomfort of doing it different. So some of the things to look at when you're doing this introspection and taking a look within is you want to look at have you is is controlling a part of your interactions do you try to control the horizontal and the vertical does your feelings and thoughts about yourself your self-esteem depend on how they're doing they have a good day and you're flying high they ha take a dive and you dive with them so is 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 your esteem and who you are and your value based on how they're doing. Um, do you get into denial that there really is a problem? Just denial isn't lying, it's just a refusal to look at what's really going on. Um, what's really happening here? Um, do you get into caretaking? By that I mean, remember we talked about this, helping before they even ask. You know, am I solving problems that aren't mine to solve? Am I fixing things that aren't mine to fix? You know, am I in total sadness and depression? Am I uh, physically ill? You know, the body will bear the burden. If we deny what's really happening for us over a length of time, it'll start showing up with heart attacks, literally. Yeah. A broken heart, you know, will, uh, rage of the bones is with arthritis and there's just this terrible uh, symptoms that show up in our body anger you know total anger inability to be close to the people around you that aren't high that is a big symptom if you're having a conversation with other loved ones and you're thinking about this person back here or if somebody asks you how you're doing and you tell them how they're doing. That'd be a big one. That'd be a big one. Yeah. And so some ways that you can kind of get familiar with your own symptoms, think, watch in one day, get a little notebook and put a little, or your phone, whatever, and put a little notch every time you think about them in a day. And then the next day, put a notch every time you think about yourself. If you want to learn more, click on the link below to get an in-depth look or explanation of codependency. We also have an online codependency quiz that you can take. And we have downloadable codependency worksheets so you can begin healing right now.